In 1984, a legend began. A legend that has it all. Friendship, betrayal, intrigue, revolution, ideology, murder, and the power of music. There's so many interesting characters, the most interesting storyline in metal history, and lots of interesting music that is both very good and very bad. This is the story of Mayhem. <laughs> Mayhem are a very important and very infamous band, and instead of explaining why right now, I'll let that unfold over the course of this video if you aren't already familiar with their history. Mayhem formed in 1984 in Norway as part of the first wave of black metal, although it was the second wave that they would end up defining. Their main influences were Venom, Hellhammer, Bathory, and the likes. Their original lineup was Oystein Arseth, a.k.a. Euronymous, on guitar. Jorn Stubrud, a.k.a. Necro Butcher, on bass. And Kjetil Mannheim, on drums. In 1986 and 1987, they released several basement demos that I don't really recommend. Afterwards, they picked up a guy named Messiah, who promptly left and was replaced by Sven Erik Christiansen, aka Maniac. He would be their vocalist on their debut EP. With Euronymous, Necrobutcher, Mannheim, and Maniac, in 1987, Mayhem released Death Crush. Death Crush is a ton of fun. It's very representative of the spirit of early black metal. By today's standards, this is hardly black metal, however. It's more in the tradition of Hellhammer, but it's very much a group of bros riffing it out and having a good time either way. The tempos vary, the arrangements are very simple and sparse, and the riffs are fat, chunky, and fun. The instrumentals are not exactly skillful, these guys were still developing their craft, to put it nicely, but Maniac's vocals are awesome and ahead of their time. He sounds, well, like a maniac, going for tortured screams, which I imagine was very ahead of the time. Anyways, Death Crush is very basic and simple, and it's an utter blast. 8 out of 10. Then Maniac and Mannheim yeeted. Mayhem's new drummer was Jan Blomberg, a.k.a. Hellhammer, named after the band, and on vocals was Mayhem's most recognizable pioneer, Per Olin, better known as Dead. In short, he made corpse paint in black metal a thing. Perhaps black metal's most iconic visual started with him. That said, he was a bit mentally unwell. He self-harmed a lot, and not just on stage like Maniac did either. He hated cats, he buried his clothes to make himself look like a zombie, and he thought that he was literally dead following a childhood accident that he barely survived. He recorded no studio releases with Mayhem, but did appear on a pair of notable live albums. First and foremost is Live in Leipzig, which debuted a number of new songs and showcased Dead's energetic and demented vocals. And second is Dawn of the Black Hearts. In 1991, Dead attempted suicide by trying to cut himself and freeze himself, 
but the two counteracted, so he shot himself in the head with a shotgun that was conveniently left loaded in the band's house. Then Euronymous took a photo of the grisly scene and used that as an album cover for Dawn of the Black Hearts, which isn't a very good live album, by the way. Also, Euronymous fashioned amulets out of Dead's skull fragments, which he gave to people he viewed as worthy. This utterly disgusted necrobutcher, so he left. Needing a new bass player, Euronymous found one. This is where Varg Vikernis comes in. It's no surprise why Varg and Euronymous got along. They both believed in a grim and dark version of black metal, and they both hated Christianity and other establishment apparatuses. By this point, Euronymous had Halvetti, his record store and black metal headquarters, and his record label Death Like Silence. And hilariously, he had what he called his black metal inner circle, a cult that he led focused on extreme politics and black metal. Death Like Silence funded and released the first Burtzum album, and Burzum, of course, is Varg's project. Then Mayhem recorded their first album, although it would not be released until later. On vocals was Attila Shihar, a classically trained Hungarian singer. At the same time, the black metal scene was growing, largely due to Euronymous's recruitment. New bands were forming, such as Enslaved, Immortal, Dark Throne, Emperor, and others. Also, a number of them got into church burning, a very mysterious crisis where throughout the early 90s, many old churches in Norway were destroyed by fire. It is impossible to say for certain exactly who did it, but there are some likely culprits. Also, Emperor's drummer committed murder, and people knew these black metalers were burning churches, just not exactly who. So, Norway's black metal scene was becoming extremely infamous. Then... In 1993, it all fell apart. The ideological difference between Euronymous and Varg, as well as their different ideas for the future of black metal, destroyed their friendship. Varg wanted to diversify the genre and have it be more artistic, where Euronymous wanted it to be stupid and cult. Euronymous wanted to cut back on the church burnings, while Varg was a bit more fanatical in that regard. Also, Euronymous was a tanky and Varg was, and still is, a fascist. Having already played bass on Mayhem's next album, Varg left the band. Around this time, Blackthorn joined as a second guitarist. The two drove from Bergen to Oslo in the middle of the night to sign a contract with Euronymous to finalize Varg's divorce. Around 3 a.m., Varg entered Euronymous' apartment and the two got into a conflict that resulted in Varg stabbing Euronymous repeatedly, supposedly in self-defense. Euronymous was dead, and Varg and Blackthorn both went to prison on account of the murder and the church burnings. Mayhem lost their leader and was in too deep with the controversy. They broke up. The following several Burzum albums were released from prison, while Mayhem's debut album was released in the following year. Oh, that's right, I'm supposed to be reviewing music. I told you the history was going to be interesting. Anyways, in 1994, De Mysterious Dom Satanus was released. <laughs> De Mysterious Dom Satanus is one of the most iconic and important black metal albums of all time, and is essential if you are getting into black metal. It is also a summary of Euronymous's idea of how black metal should be, an idea he was fanatical about. On this channel, I like to be honest. If I don't like a classic album, I'll say so. I don't like De Mysterious Dom Satanus. It's an album that frustrates me quite a bit, actually. In fact, it represents what I don't like about large swaths of the black metal genre. Just having a bunch of tremolo riffs and blast beats isn't interesting or fun. It's stupid. 
The best moments on this album are the divergences from this when there is actual melody, but those are few and far between. The most iconic Mayhem song, Freezing Moon, is an example of this. Its intro riff is instantly recognizable because it's an amazing riff, but most of the song is dull compared to that. The best song on the album is the title track due to the riffs just being more interesting there, but still I barely have the energy to listen to it. What about the musicianship? Well, that's a mixed bag. Euronymous's guitar playing is fine, I guess, and Varg's bass does its job. Hellhammer's drumming is really annoying because it's near constant blast beats, and that just isn't something I enjoy, although, to be fair, he is very good at what he does. The best part of the album, however, is easily Attila, whose vocals are a strange trisection of typical black metal vocals, throat singing, and opera. It's surreal and an incredible sound to behold. Overall, this just isn't my cup of tea, I guess. Demysterius Dom Satanus alternates between boring me and annoying me, and its strengths aren't enough to keep me invested. It's kinda interesting and certainly historically important, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Now, I don't want to rain on your parade. If you enjoyed this album, I am glad. I don't. 4 out of 10. The downtime and successful release of their album enticed Mayhem to get back together in 1994, a decade after their original formation. All the drama, radicalization, and other bullshit would remain in the past. They would be a clean black metal band focused on the music. Aura Noir's Rune Erickson, aka Blasphemer, would be their new guitarist, while Maniac and Necrobutcher returned on vocals and bass. Necrobutcher and Hellhammer would be the leaders of Mayhem from here on out. In 1997, their comeback EP was released. Wolf's Lair Abyss. Wolf's Lair Abyss is a continuation of Demysterius Dom Satanus. It's still atmospheric, still reliant on blasts and extremely simple riffs, still good in the vocal department since Maniac is awesome, and still not amazing. But it is good. Why? Variety. The songwriting is more varied, with more changes, different kinds of riffs, more melody, and more experimental moments. Although this isn't my go-to Mayhem release, it's enjoyable because that variety breaks up the monotony and because the riffs are just better. That and it's an EP so it doesn't overstay its welcome. Wolf Slayer Abyss is a substantial step forward and gets a 6 out of 10. What Mayhem should have done next was a more melodic album with some experimentation. What we actually got was that, except it's the black metal equivalent of a meth trip. In 2000, Mayhem released... Grand Declaration of War. What are they declaring war on? conventional black metal, because this is an extremely strange album. It's basically avant-garde. There's a lot of weird shit. A lot of this album focuses on experimentation, and a lot of it is extremely cringe. I don't like hearing Maniac talk like a cross between a WWE wrestler and a union leader, but with philosophical nonsense. When the album is actually metal, however, it gets better. There's a lot more melody, and the riffs are a big step up. There's some boringness, but not as much as before. Also, this album got a remaster in 2018 with a new mix, new cover, and some much-needed tracklist adjustments. Overall, Grand Declaration of War is very mixed, with the good stuff contrasting but ultimately outnumbering the awful stuff. The original version is a 5 out of 10. 
and the remaster is a 6 out of 10. In my opinion, the remaster is this album's definitive version. One thing that didn't change was Mayhem's intense live shows. So intense that a literal severed sheep head was thrown into the crowd and injured a fan, resulting in a legal battle. Anyways, Chimera came out in 2004. Chimera is a gigantic step in the right direction. It abandons everything I don't like about Mayhem's previous releases and both simplifies and streamlines what I do like from those releases. This is a slower and more melodic album with plenty of weirdness. Maniac's vocals are more raspy than before but are just as maniacal, while Hellhammer's drumming is more creative and technical. Best of all, the riffs are great. They are complex, weird, filled with melody, and are otherwise distinct and unconventional. Additionally, Chimera is very consistent. No weak moments. My issue with this album is the production. Although the guitar tone is incredible, there's no atmosphere and too much loudness. It's a little headache-inducing. That said, this is Mayhem finding their voice. 7 out of 10. After Chimera's release, Maniac ran into some problems. He developed very bad stage fright and used alcohol to cope. This turned into alcoholism and to top it off his personal life made it hard to find time for mayhem. So he left and focused on himself. And yes, he did stop drinking not long after. His replacement? Attila. With mayhem growing more avant-garde, one of the best and most unique vocalists in all of black metal was just what they needed. In 2007, Ordo Ad Keo was released. Ordo Ad Keo is a very strange album, but in a cohesive way without any erraticness. The first thing you'll notice is that this album sounds like it was recorded underwater. It's extremely odd, and Ordo Ad Keo has come to be defined by it, and it has also caused this album to be very divisive. If you want a weird, atmospheric album with avant-garde riffs, this album is very good at being that. However, you might lack the patience for this album, especially considering that Attila brought in some elements from the infamous Dronester's son his other band. It's hard to get into, but the unconventional songwriting, strange atmosphere, and of course Attila's genius vocals really appeals to my taste. 8 out of 10. The following year, Blasphemer left, presumably to focus on Ara Noir. Replacing him was two guitarists, Morten Iversen, aka Telok, and Charles Hedger, aka Ghoul. There was a long gap between albums, but finally Mayhem returned in 2014 with Esoteric Warfare. <laughs> Thus far, I haven't been too kind to Mayhem. You've probably been wondering throughout this video what my favorite album of theirs is. It's this one. Esoteric Warfare is mayhem perfected. It takes the experimental riffage of the previous two albums and both makes it more experimental and even better while keeping Ordo's atmosphere. The quality of the riffs, production, and musicianship is an all-time high for Mayhem. Attila's vocals are even weirder, delving further into throat singing. In particular is Melab, my favorite Mayhem song ever, but every song here is excellent. If I were to change one thing though, I'd make it about 5 minutes shorter. Otherwise, this album is simply a masterpiece of creativity and weirdness, and is one of the best black metal albums of its decade, if not ever. It took them a while, but Mayhem finally made their magnum opus. 9 out of 10. 
On the subject of late career peaks, Mayhem's popularity grew greatly last year. For years, talk of a biopic about Mayhem, directed by Jonas Ackerlund, Bathory's original drummer, had been a thing. When trailers were released, doubt that it would even happen was replaced with doubt that it would be good. Regardless, it came out in early 2019, and it ended up being very good, at least in my opinion. The massive publicity it gave Mayhem must have prompted them to act quick, because later that year, an album came out, their newest. That album is titled... Damon. Diamond, Damon, Demon, Diamond? I don't know, man. When I first heard Damon, it wasn't what I was expecting. It's blackened death metal, a new direction for Mayhem. More specifically, it's an amalgamation of Mayhem's discography plus death metal elements. It's a very chaotic album with enough experimentation and dynamism to keep me on my toes while also being riffy and grounded in its own genre. Consequently, it's a very distinct album that should please any fan of blackened death metal. That said, this album reminds me of why I'm not a huge fan of blackened death metal. The riffs honestly aren't amazing here for the most part, and all the songs basically sound the same. The satanic themes, which are disproportionately common in blackened death metal, are still tedious, and this album is also about 10 minutes too long. Although it should please most fans, I'm not a fan of Damon at the end of the day. It's cool and interesting and well put together, but it doesn't do a whole lot for me personally. 5 out of 10. And that is Mayhem. Ultimately, Mayhem are an extremely interesting and very important band, but I don't think their music is really all that great. I think they only actually have two great albums, and the rest of their discography ranges from good to bad. However, they are still worth exploring and discussing, again for the sheer craziness of their history and the interesting progression of their sound. They remain one of the most unique and legendary extreme metal bands, even if I'm not enthused by a majority of their discography. Thank you for watching my Mayhem band review. My ranking is on screen now. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing so you can watch more of it, and if you are so inclined, I appreciate bringing the discussion down into the comments. With nothing more for me to say, I will see you in my next video. I was on my way down to kill him myself, and uh, uh, when it happened, I just saw the morning paper, and I'm thinking, fuck, I gotta get home to my place and get out all, all the weapons and drugs and shit I had in my house, because they're coming to my house, because I'm probably gonna be a number one suspect for this. But little did I know that the Norwegian police already knew that uh, Count Grishnak was going, going down to Oslo to kill him, because they bugged his phone, and he actually talked about this killing before. He went from Bergen, so the cops already knew uh, that it was coming, so they're probably thinking to themselves, okay, uh, we didn't nail this guy for church burning, so let's nail him for murder and get rid of this fucking guy in Oslo at the same time.